pleasure to be here. And what I'm going to do is to describe my journey. But I'm going to start with where I am now uh, and then um, go backwards. Uh, I recently published a book called Understanding Dyslexia and Other Learning Disabilities. And it was really meant for parents, teachers, the general public. It was not meant as a textbook. I had visions, uh, as I was writing it, of it becoming a bestseller. Well, I thought that perhaps it was too much to expect that the New York Times or The Guardian would review it, but I had hoped for the, Vancou for the Vancouver Sun. So far, it's been reviewed by one newspaper, the Salt Spring Island Driftwood. <laughs> <laughs> And the review has, uh, to my knowledge, been read by four people. <laughs> so I thought I would uh, start with, uh, read the introduction to the book, and that will give you an idea of where I'm going with this talk. We live in the midst of an educational tragedy. Schools are failing to identify and treat many children with dyslexia and other learning disabilities. There is a battle among parents, teachers, educational bureaucrats, and related professionals with children caught in the crossfire. There are no guns, tanks, and explosives in this conflict. The weapons in this struggle are complicated laws, requirements for extensive testing to identify a learning disability, destruction of students' self-esteem, belittlement of parents' and teachers' concerns, inadequate teacher training, blaming academic failure on behavioral problems, and erecting senseless barriers to reform. The result is tragic. Many children who struggle with learning become nameless, faceless ghosts haunting our schools and later our jails and mental institutions, or living dangerous and aimless lives as homeless people on our streets. Some die at a young age from drunk overdoses or suicide, the ultimate nightmare of parents. Children are not the only casualties. Adults also suffer from learning disabilities that were not recognized when they were in school and were never treated. Depression, anxiety, and deep feelings of inadequacy often prevent adults with learning disabilities from developing close relationships, finding rewarding employment, and living happy and productive lives. So when I uh, started in this field in uh, late 70s, I uh, was really overwhelmed with the lack of uh, a definition of what learning disabilities were. And uh, that was um, really, it was, I had been brought up in the tradition of, uh, of uh, the, uh, science and operational definitions, and I wondered how could you study something or even do anything about it if you didn't have an operational definition. So um, my early concerns were for developing a definition. We know that uh, children with learning disabilities are at very significant risk for mental health problems including de anxiety, depression, conduct disorder. And this is one of the reasons that I devoted at least the latter part of my career toward working on identifying and treating learning disabilities. Um, this is some research that I did when, when I first got into the field. And we worked with the y homeless young people who lived on the streets of Toronto. And we found that 82% of them had learning disabilities that had not <coughs> been identified um, or treated. Now, they had all gone through at least grade 10 in Ontario. So it wasn't a matter of them dropping out of school early, at least um, before grade 10. So that <coughs> really wasn't an issue. We studied all of the uh, suicides adolescent suicides in a three-year period in Ontario. And we found that in every single one of those cases, there was evidence of a learning disability that had not been identified 
or treat it. And we know from other research in many different countries that a very significant portion of the people in jail have learning disabilities that have not been identified and treated. Now, I came across this firsthand because um, a little over 10 years ago, I was a juror in a trial of two young men who were accused of uh, drug trafficking, you know, conspiracy to sell drugs, etc. It was um, uh, cocaine and ecstasy. And I didn't make any attempt to get out of the, uh, of the trial. Um, I went to Perry Leslie, who was the chair at that time, and I said, I've been called um, to come down to be considered for jury duty. And the first thing he says, oh, I'm not going to write you a letter to get out of it. It's your civic duty. Well, I didn't want to. I thought, oh, this would be an interesting experience. And besides, they weren't going to pick me, because um, if they found out that I was a psychologist, they don't like psychologists on juries. So, and I don't know why, because I would think that certainly the defense would want a psychologist who would have more understanding. But anyway, so I went down, very confident that I wouldn't be picked. And uh, the first one, um, the first case, there were five cases. The first case um, was. Uh, a rape case, and it turned out that all females were rejected from the jury. Um, so then the next one came along, and they they called me and they and they said, "What do you do?" They're allowed to ask you what you do. So I said, um, "I teach at the university. What do you teach? Educational psychology." Um, and um, they just nodded and said, you're in. Um, so uh, I went, and I sat through the trial was four months. And um, <laughs> during the course of the trial, it became clear to me there were two uh, defendants. And one of them clearly had dyslexia. And I could describe how I, um, how I deduced that. And there was also a witness who had been their associate, who I also um, saw was dyslexic. And there are a number of ways. We had to listen to a lot of telephone intercepts. And um, they, they were asked questions, for example, their, during this, their telephone numbers or their addresses. And one of them, the one who wasn't dyslexic, could say it very quickly. The one who was dyslexic couldn't remember his address, his telephone number. Again, this, if they'd asked him his, co his postal code, that would have been a total disaster. But um, so uh, he also, the dyslexic one, had um, some word finding difficulties, which you frequently find in, in dyslexia. He would substitute one word for the next. Uh, for something else that sounded similar. This is also something that you see. At one point, he was given something to read. And they held it in front of him. And he just went like this, and as if he read it. Now, I think everybody in this room could read quite quickly, but you can't read that quickly. So um, I was pretty sure he was dyslexic. And by the way, that was later confirmed when I happened to be at a meeting at of the high school that he had gone to. And uh, I just asked about him. And uh, I said, you know, I think he was dyslexic. And actually, they agreed with me. Uh, the, it was a similar situation with the, uh, with the witness against them. Well, they were found guilty. And when we came into the uh, into the courtroom to give our verdict. Hardly anybody had been at the trial the whole time. Um, there were, I counted, 11 sheriffs with guns. And I couldn't figure out why this was so important. Well, it turned out that it was the Hells Angels. And we didn't know 
none of the jurors knew that. And any time there was any mention of that, they, um, they, they removed all mention of it, but it's sometimes we had to leave the courtroom, I think, while they removed something that might uh, have uh, led us to believe they were Hell's Angels. So uh, I kept um, looking at these young men and thinking how different it would have been if somebody had done something for at least two of them. Uh, and uh, it's, I think this is an example of one of the tragedies of the system because if nothing else, the investigation and the trial cost $2 million. You think about how much special education that would buy um, and uh, you know all this um, dispute about the teacher's salaries. And that's just one case in one city in British Columbia. And this is repeated um, over again. And maybe not all of the investigations cost two million, um, but um, they all cost something. Okay. So part of the reason that these young men weren't identified was um, the definition the issues about definition. And one of the major issues is what is called the discrepancy definition. That is, uh, in order to be considered to have a learning disability, the, your achievement has to be significantly lower than your IQ. Uh, and until very recently, this was the definition in British Columbia. And furthermore, they required that your uh, achievement to be two standard deviations below your IQ. Uh, it's still used in many places, and it's used unofficially in many districts. So I will just briefly show you a study that in 1989, I um, published an article, IQ is Irrelevant the definition of learning disabilities. And uh, it created a lot of controversy. And uh, there were about 10 people who wrote a rebuttal to it that appeared in the same issue. And now, every single one of those 10 people, except one, has come to me and said, I agree with you. So, of course, it's taken 25 years, but that's another <laughs> story. So, just briefly, I'll show you one of the, some of the ammunition um, about dyslexia and why the, de uh, the discrepancy definition is irrelevant. Um, we ha I had three groups, normal readers, dyslexics, who did have the discrepancy, and children who were poor readers that had low reading scores but they had no discrepancy. Um, and so these were called low achievers. Okay, so this is what their IQ scores look like. Um, so the red is the normal readers, the uh, blue is the dyslexics, and uh, this was a very large sample, so that was actually um, a statistically significant difference. Uh, and you can see that the poor readers had um, basically mean IQs of about 80. So some of them were even lower than 80. Okay, so this is what the scores on a, a word recognition test. This was the right wide range achievement. So the two dyslexic groups did not differ. And of course, they were very different from um, the uh, normal readers. And this is pseudo word reading, and again, it's the same pattern. Now, this is particularly important because this is reading comprehension. And one of the arguments is that uh, some children may have um, uh, reading problems, but if they have higher IQs, that can compensate 
and uh, for their uh, reading difficulties. Well, this is obviously not the case, that um, there's no difference between the normal readers, I'm sorry, between the, the two groups of poor readers, the dyslexics and um, uh, the, uh, the poor readers. There's no difference. And this was true on every kind of test that I could give them, except the subtests of the IQ test. So um, that, to me, was ammunition of how uh, it didn't really have an impact on your reading. The IQ didn't have an impact on your reading. Um, and other people, many other studies, have shown that IQ scores do not predict the ability to benefit from remediation. However, um, this information um, certainly never made it to, to the uh, school districts and even to the Disability Resource Center here. Now, before I, as a kind of a research community service project, I, did, I tested a lot of uh, individuals, some of them university students who wanted accommodations. And I, of course, if I found that they had very low reading scores <coughs> or low math scores or whatever, I would describe it as a learning disability. And the Disability Resource Services um, refused to honor my reports because I didn't have the IQ test. Now, these were university students who had been admitted to UBC. So if you want to argue somebody, you need an IQ test to see if somebody is intellectually handicapped or whatever, but what, what about universities? Some of them were graduate students working on master's degrees, and still um, they required an IQ test. Now, you could say, well, what's so bad about giving them an IQ test? Well, they don't do it there. They require you to go to a psychologist um, who will charge now apparently is up to $2,000. Now, you're going to re why require students who have limited budgets to pay $2,000 to get a test which isn't going to tell you anything <clears throat> about what to do with them. Uh, now, it's even worse because recently, just a few weeks ago, uh, a student came to me um, with, he had a university student with cerebral palsy and he had some auditory challenges and for his program he was required to take a foreign language. And it, uh, we tried to make the argument that um, you know, he had these auditory challenges and some others, and that if he could substitute something else for the foreign language requirement. Uh, so they said, no, it, because you didn't do the IQ test. And I pointed out to him that the IQ test, the, the, the counselor, whoever was dealing with this case, I pointed out that the IQ test uh, was not normed on people with cerebral palsy. And to give a test, it really it would be unethical to give him an IQ test because people with his problem were not part of the standardization sample. Um, <clears throat> well, I won that argument. But uh, still, you're still requiring the IQ test. So rather than be negative about you know, not giving the IQ, IQ test, um, this is what we should be giving achievement tests. And if a person has a low score on an achievement test, then it should be considered as a problem. And we should do what we can to help them. Now, it's not just looking at the scores, but looking at the kinds of errors they make. Um, and that sometimes can give a clue to how you might provide remediation. So for me, this is a comprehensive assessment of um, what is required for a learning disability and number of tests. And my argument is that teachers should be able to, should be trained to do this. And there's no reason why this, some of these are individual tests. 
which then um, would require a TOC, a teacher on call, to take the class while the teacher did this. But it's not for many days, and some of these are group tests. And I have the interview in there because I think it's very important to find out the strengths and the abilities of people with learning disabilities. So I thought that really the important thing was early identification of children at risk and identification of individuals with learning disabilities without a complicated assessment process. I just briefly went through what should be done. Uh, so, I embarked on a study of early identification and intervention in North Vancouver when I first came here. And these are the results of this study. Um, so, when the children were in kindergarten, we gave them a screening test, and we discovered that 25% of the children who had English as a first language were at risk. And 50% of the children who had English as a second language, um, now called English language learners, a term which I dislike because I've been speaking the English language for many years and I'm still learning something about it and I'm not an English language learner in the sense that they mean it. But anyway, so this was what it looked like. And these are the results of the children who had reading problems in grade seven. It's 1.5% of the children had reading difficulties. Oh, by the way, this is the whole North Vancouver School District, um, and 1.5% uh, uh, of the children have English as a second language. So it was possible to identify them, and I'll talk briefly about the intervention, but I just want to show one more. Oh, these were the languages of the children in the study. So. 30 different languages. So these, this was the results under just a word. This is the Woodcock-Johnson word identification. And you, the red are the uh, children who were <coughs> normal readers and uh, had English as a first language. The aqua are the children who had English as a second language and were also good readers. And the yellow are the monolingual dyslexics and the green are the um, a bilingual dyslexics. So there was no difference for the typical readers. Um, and their mean scores are, were at the 83rd percentile. So this is, again, for the whole district. Now, the, the dyslexics had significantly higher scores than the English first language dyslexics the bilingual dyslexics had significantly higher scores. And that was true in all the tests that we gave them. This is the word attack test, the non-word reading test, really critical. Um, this is reading fluency. This is a phonological awareness test. This is a spelling test. Now, in this case, the, um, what the normal readers who were um, bilingual, had English as a second language, had higher scores, significantly higher scores, that's 10 percentile points, than the um, monolingual uh, normal readers. Okay, so, and, and that was certainly true of the dyslexics. So I thought, I actually found similar results before in other samples, and um, I thought a lot about it. But why would that be? Now, uh, what, uh, a significant portion of the children who uh, were in North Vancouver had Chinese as a first language. And furthermore, they went to heritage language school, so they learned reading and writing in Chinese. Of course, they could all speak Chinese or some one of the Chinese dialects. Um, this, uh, by the way, this, this is an example, I think you've all seen Chinese, but this sentence says, I like watching television. So think of the visual memory that you develop in order to read Chinese. One of the things you need for English spelling is good visual memory 
because of our irregular words. That, you know, words like have and uh, said and all that, you just have to memorize them. Another language that was quite common in North Vancouver was Farsi, which is written in Arabic script. And the children went to um, school, to school where they learned to read and write Farsi. So this is what Arabic, I'm sure you've all seen Arabic. This is what it looks like. And here's a children's book in Arabic. So think about the visual discrimination and visual memory that you need to develop in order to read that language. But you also need good phonological skills. You have to be able to hear the sounds in the word to be able to write them down. So uh, any language has different sounds from some different sounds from English. This, I think, is the reason for the good spelling. Okay. Now. The children had a program in kindergarten and grade one called Firm Foundations. And Firm Foundations uh, was a program developed by the teachers of North Vancouver. It's games and activities to teach the children the sounds of the letters uh, and phonological awareness skills, hearing the sounds within words. And it's a very lovely program. Uh, it's very inexpensive. The teacher gets a book with all the games and activities, and um, it's uh, very, si very simple to use. If you can read, you can pick it up. Uh, it's, um, and it's used in North Vancouver. But they also had a, uh, a program called Reading 44. This is another, this was also written by the teachers of North Vancouver. And it uh, teaches skills to improve your reading comprehension. And this is a standardized reading comprehension test. Again, these are the results in grade seven. And both for the typical readers, the, uh, whether they're ESL or English uh, first language, um, they're at the, on the average at the 65th percentile for this test. The dyslexics, there's no difference between the uh, ESL and um, the monolingual children. Now, a number of people have shown that it is possible for children, language minority children, to catch up in terms of their basic word reading skills. But this is the first demonstration that reading comprehension skills um, in children with English as a second language or with a minority language um, it can actually be the same as those with, uh, of children who are um, minority language speakers. So this program, which was very well done by the teachers of North Vancouver, um, really did make a difference. What is really very sad is that this program, which is inexpensive, easy to use, and works, uh, is not featured at all on the Ministry of Education website. The primary program is two, which describes what you should do from K to grade uh, three of the, the primary literacy program, 232 pages and not one mention of firm foundations in it. So this is a local program developed by teachers where there's evidence that it works, and it's not there. So if you want to ask me why it's not there, I think basically what you have is, um, and what I call the whole language mafia. And the whole language mafia just <coughs> completely ignores firm foundations, phonics, phonological awareness, that you just don't do it. And I, I can't give you any justification for it, um, but so that whenever there's any discussion about reading or literacy, 
It's just not mentioned. Um, if it were an expensive program from somewhere outside of Canada, one might argue that that's the reason, but it's really a local program, and very well done. So I think one of the important areas in um, this whole field, and something that we really haven't been doing very much of, is finding the abilities and the strengths of uh, individuals with learning disabilities. So this is a drawing that was done by a eight-year-old girl who was very dyslexic. And I had tested her, and she was in the waiting room uh, waiting for her mother, and she asked for a magic marker and a piece of paper. And so I gave it to her, and this is what she did in five minutes. So notice how um, the good proportions, the way um, she uh, uses space, the expression, um, the way she creates dimensions, the shading, etc. cetera. Um, of course, the school was completely unaware of her abilities. But her mother brought me another drawing that she had done. And remember, she's eight years old. You could recognize the girl, and she's saying something to her mother, but we can't read it and nobody could read it. And you notice the boy who looks like he's falling down. Well, he had called her a dummy and a retard because she was struggling with reading. Um, she kicked him and he fell down. And she's telling the story to her mother. Well, obviously, that's not the strategy uh, that um, children should be using in school, but this is, she experiences, she and other children with learning disabilities experience these um, taunts and teasing um, from maybe just a few children or one child in the class. But if you're eight years old, it's difficult to, um, to take. So um, I show that as an illustration of what um, children with learning disabilities experience. Um, this is, I'm sure many of you will recognize it, um, Guernica by uh, Picasso. And it's a very, not only is it a very interesting uh, painting, but it's also quite historical because this is um, an, uh, an illustration of the um, bombing uh, of a, during the Spanish Civil War of a town in northern Spain with the planes were um, given to the, the Spanish um, army by uh, Germany and Italy. And this was really the first truly uh, true attack on civilians. There was no military target involved. So this was the beginning uh, during World War II period immediately preceding it. This was 1937. This was the beginning of really involving not just soldiers in war, but civilians. So the, the reason I show that is that Picasso was dyslexic. He learned to read very late. He had spelling and handwriting problems. Uh, he would do anything to get out of school. He was punished in school. He's put in a little um, room that they called the caboose. And uh, if you misbehaved or uh, had reading problems or whatever, you put into this room. And uh, he um, was really struggling during a school examination. This was to get into the equivalent of high school. And the examiner felt very sorry for him so gave him, um, let him sort of expose the answers so he could get the right answers, um, so he could get into school. Learn more about this and purchase Understanding Dyslexia and Other Learning Disabilities by Linda Siegel, available by Pacific Educational Press.